Davina, we are live. Let me confirm all the tech is doing what it should be doing. It looks like we uh look, it's all happening the way we want it to be happening. Beautiful. Oh my goodness, this is a really big moment that uh, I've been really looking forward to. Davina Avery, an absolute delight and a privilege to have you with us. How are you doing today? Great, thank you. That's fantastic. Davina's joining us from Adelaide. So how's the vibe in Adelaide, Australia today? Oh, it's great. <laughs> the sun's shining. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, fam, uh, I want to just start the session with um, due, uh, due warning. You know, I want to let you know that this session may be one of the deepest sessions we've ever, uh, ever gone into. It's going to be really, really raw. Um, this, is, this is the type of uh, session that we are uh like we have a heart and Davina has a real heart to go into the darkest places and set the captives and the prisoners free and that's because that's where she's come from so to be able you may want to just check for yourself if you cannot handle extreme content this is going to be extreme content okay so um, fair warning for everyone, whether you are live or you're watching the replay, um, please understand that this is going to be raw, it's going to be real, it's going to be vulnerable, and um, the story, Davina's story is really, actually, we were just talking about this, this is also like the spoils of war for the kingdom, right? This is Jesus. Uh, Davina is like a trophy <laughs> in the kingdom. She's like Jesus um, putting his goodness on display and her just revealing how, um, how deep redemption can go, how powerful the power of God is to heal and redeem. This is love's revenge in motion as he has reached into the depths of the darkness and plucked someone out and healed and restored uh, and revived their life. So Davina, it's an absolute honor and a delight to have you on. I think that everyone has kind of braced themselves now. I think that everyone's ready and uh, uh, they're on point, and I know we're all really excited. Um, some will be intrigued, but we're really looking forward to our time together today. Um, be great if you would like to pray for us. So if you want to uh, pray to start us off, that will be absolutely amazing. Great. Thank you, Benji. Oh, God, I, I want to worship you, Lord. I oh, thank you that you actually do bring good out of every situation. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And I pray that you will just guide this conversation and that you will open up hearts as people listen. And I just put up sight and sound like barriers to against the demonic realm, Lord Jesus, to protect us as we speak about these dark things. And I I pray like you would release angels to everyone who is listening so um, that triggers will be shut down, Lord Jesus. Depression, hopelessness has no home here. This is hope and this is all to glorify you. So thank you, Lord. We lift up your name and we worship you. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Papa, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for uh, your freedom story. We thank you that you are, um, you are the one who gives us beauty for ashes. <laughs> uh, we thank you that you give us a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Uh, we thank you that you take us, Lord, from everywhere that you, we have been, and you bring us to a place where we are oaks of righteousness for the display of your splendor and we thank you for the session that we get to celebrate 
the beauty and the wonder of your goodness and kindness and redemption in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. A uh, massive welcome once again to everyone. It is such an honor to have you uh, on this journey. And this is session seven in the beautiful journey. And uh, Davina, we are really excited to hear your story and jump deep into it. So fam, um, for those who are out there, uh, I see a bunch of people jumping on from around the world. It's excellent. Feel free to drop some love for Davina in the comments and let us know where you are tracking in from. Let us know as well. Share the testimonies of what God's been doing so far for you in this uh, in a healing and transformations course. We're very excited to celebrate with you what God's doing. So uh, Davina, why don't you just give us a little bit of a snapshot of your world right now, where you are, what you're doing, and what's happening for you? Oh, right now. Oh, so I, I have been living in Darwin for 10 and a half years, but I moved to Adelaide to join um, a school at my church called Illuminate. <laughs> yes. And it is loads of fun. This church is just, yeah, switched on and on fire. Yeah. That's so cool. It is uh, one of my favorite churches in the world. You're with Todd Weatherly at Field of Dreams in Adelaide. Yes. Whoop, whoop. Mm -hmm. Lots of love to all yeah. our crew in Adelaide and the Field of Dreams uh, team. We love you guys so much. So um, here you are. Now, how old are you, Davina? Uh, I'm 57. 57. Okay, right. Well, we just wanted to check you. 57. So you've got 57 years worth of wild uh, journey and story. Mm -hmm. Um, for us so we're just getting a little bit of context uh, about who you are where you're at right now now are you um, kids no kids what's your what's your story married single tell us a bit about um, who you are well I was married for 29 years and uh, my ex-husband and I we um, we were in ministry um, we ran a youth refuge, we worked on a drug and alcohol rehab, we then ended up pastoring churches. Um, unfortunately, we're not together now, but um, but we have two beautiful children, uh, boys, and they are living in different states. They're both adults, yeah. Yeah, so amazing. Well, fam, um, I just wanted to have a little bit of context for where Davina's at right now. And um, you're going to really uh, love her story and love what God is doing in her life. And so uh, Davina, we're going to go, we're going to go way back right now. People have got a little bit of a glimpse of your world. I'm like, okay, who is this lady? Well, um, get ready fam. It's um, it is truly a beautiful story. So Davina, um, can you just share a little bit before we go all the way back? Can you share a little bit about your heart for redeeming people from the darkest places? Oh, sure. Um, definitely. When you come out of a really dark place, then you have the authority in that area. So I have the authority against witchcraft, <laughs> just declaring that. Um, <clears throat> so... My heart is to see people delivered. The ones that are the, um, that they, like if you think there's no hope for me, I'm a lost cause or people have written you off, they're the ones. That's, <laughs> that's your where, people. Yeah, that's where I was. And I really thought I was going to, I was going to have this like mental illness, be suicidal for the rest of my life. And it's a complete and utter lie, complete lie. Wow. So this, this is my, um, my heart to bring them into an army really and to go after to go after the others and to go into the darkest places like for the traffic and you know prostitutes everywhere um into the covens wherever god sends us and to rescue people it's that um isaiah 61 3 mandate yes yeah. the, the lord is upon me because he's um to preach good news to the poor and he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Come on. That uh, Isaiah 61 has yeah. uh, been such a resounding theme throughout this journey. It's so beautiful and priceless. So um, 
Davina, where did you grow up? I grew up in Sydney. Yeah. In, um, yeah, in Sutherland Shire. Yeah, okay, so That's you grew up. Australia. Um, and what was your family like? Siblings, parents? Um, I had an older brother, uh, one year older. So I was born in England and we came out when I was really little. Um, my dad, with mum and dad, um, and mum was a stay-at-home mum and dad worked like extremely hard. He was a bit of a workaholic and very strict, just, just really strict. I was frightened of him. I didn't really know why. Yeah. Yeah. So as we've kind of talked, I mean, even Isaiah 61 that you just mentioned right there, um, it says, you know, that Jesus, uh, you know, says he had the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news and to bind up the brokenhearted. And that word, as we've mentioned in Hebrew, Shabbat, it means the shattered minds. And that really is a satanic assignment against uh, yeah. our lives. If Satan can, if he can get the claws in, he's going to go after shattering the mind. And yeah. there's nothing more effective to shatter the mind than trauma. Yeah. And there's different types of trauma that we can go through. We can go through trauma. You know, Marlene shared a really powerful story of yeah. trauma in the context of, um, you know, sexual abuse for years. Uh, Justin, you know, in our last session said that shared the trauma of divorce and uh, Renee in a previous session, you know, she shared the trauma of just misperceiving her father and feeling like her father had no time for her and she was never good enough. So trauma can happen in a number of different ways. Um, but trauma can also be weaponized, you know, and really intentionally and systematically. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. Uh, as I've listened to your story, Davina, it would seem to me that the trauma that you went through was not regular trauma of, oh, hey, this is kind of like, because oftentimes it's kind of like one person or something like that. But then there's systematic trauma, which Satan really uses to shatter minds to an extreme level. So Mm. Davina, when did you kind of start to realize that the tr you'd been through a lot of trauma as a child? I think um, that I just grew up with a sadness and I, I didn't know what it was. So I didn't have any memory of childhood. And, um, and when I had counselling, they always try and take you back there and I didn't have anything. And then as a teenager, I was just melancholic and then I ended up with depression and I just couldn't really shake it. And yeah. then... I, I mean, that's, that's similar to Marlene, you know, for example, as well. After her abuse, she blocked out. And this is what the shattered yeah. mind does, right? The shattered mind fragments. So, and and doesn't necessarily disappear, but it goes so, so deep. That's what disassociation is, right? It's, it's, yes. it's different. You shatter. You personally shatter into multiple different parts. And that's why a person can, you know, be on an inner healing journey. And it might, they might all of a sudden realize, whoa, a whole section of their life, which they didn't have any conscious access to, all of a sudden, boom, that is right there. And they're like, ah, dealing with this whole like world of chaos. Uh, we've seen it yeah. over and over again. So yeah, yeah. that starts Most, happening for you. Yeah. Mostly the signs are there, but you don't see them. You can't, you can't comprehend that this would happen. So as it started to unfold, as your, you know, as your shattered pieces started coming back together and you started um, to rediscover yourself, what did you unearth? What was happening in your childhood that caused you to completely shatter and disassociate? And <laughs> Well, it, it's hard to know where to start. Um, it was the, the first... So growing up, I had I had stills of neighbours and think like you know in in underwear and weird weird pictures in my mind. So I knew that something had happened with neighbours in in that area where I grew up. But the first memory that came back to me was of my father, and I had this terror 
of displeasing him and getting into trouble. And I, but I could never remember actually getting into trouble. And so the first memory was what happened when we got into trouble. And it was um, basically, a, you know, my mum was leaving, going somewhere, and then I'm crying and grabbing onto her. And I had this recurring dream, don't leave me, don't leave me. And, um, and then he took me into my bedroom and raped me. And, and then this, like these memories, once I opened them up, they just started to pile out and more memories about him and him. And then and they just seemed to get deeper and deeper of what he was involved in. I don't even think he understood what he was involved in. Yeah. It, um, It was just, I just blanked it all out that I, um, that I, yeah, I formed all these little girls that would, um, would take all these different memories away so that I could cope. And I was a quite a high achiever and I was a really good girl. So that, that's how I managed that. That's a, that's a really um, important key, right? That's what, that's a big part of what disassociation is. And that's what the shattered mind, that's what the shattered mind does. Mm. um and he, and actually oftentimes when you are on an, in a healing journey if you've disassociated in order to cope with trauma this is mm. this is like the natural process of the mind it's a predictable outcome it's not a surprise these are all predictable mm. documented mm. processes outcomes this is so like textbook mm. okay this is textbook of how the mind works in extreme yeah. trauma I actually that... believe it's a gift from God. It's like a fuse in your mind when you can't, you just can't cope with it, that your carers are doing this to you. And it's like a fuse and you, it like clicks out <laughs> and you forget or you switch yeah. um, to somebody else to cope with that. And then they go away and then you come back and it's just everything's fine now. Yeah, because it's like a part of your mind gets develops a character and say this character is Lucy. Did you have a character? Did they have names or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, but but it was more um, my my first split was called Little Girl, mm -hmm. and then and then there were other splits into different feelings. More that I had an mm -hmm. angry child and a um, a good little girl and a frozen child who took all the fears so all the feelings just sort of got sucked out of me and I was just sort of left this blank feelingless you know coping person yeah so there's these in, these inbuilt psychological coping mechanisms that the mind kind of creates on autopilot for us and they're predictable outcomes and they happen uh that that's exactly what <laughs> will happen in any any case of extreme trauma mm -hmm. So, but, but there's next level because um, dad, my dad was involved in a satanic group and they actually, they purposefully split children. So I had a memory of when I was 18 months old having shock treatment. So they actually go and they split you so then they can do whatever they want and they are assured. They'll know that you won't tell anyone, you won't remember. Yeah. It, the more that you explore into this fam or the more that you deal with people coming out of this. And so what you're talking about um, is sometimes you might hear someone say SRA or you might yeah. see it sometimes on an healing form if you're going for a, you know for an in healing thing they might say you know are you a a victim of SRA which it stands for satanic ritualistic abuse and and in my experience the most hideous despicable traumas that I've ever come across have all come out of satanic ritualistic abuse mm. because it's not random mm. majority of people that go through trauma it's kind of random you know like there was there's a there's a a villain of some sort that comes into their life and steals their innocence or creates chaos or there's a divorce or there's you know some type of uh, intense suffering but satanic ritualistic abuse is actually a science 
Yeah. And it's a craft, you know, it's it's yeah. very, very specific, targeted. They understand the psychological processes and they push those buttons for predictable outcomes. And one of the reasons why we are covering this content, actually even included including it in, is because while you might think, oh, maybe that doesn't happen all that often, it is remarkably common. Yeah. And part of running in to rescue the captives and the prisoners, you'll be you'll be surprised about how many people in your neighborhood are victims of satanic ritualistic abuse. And if we're going to run into the darkest places, and if we're going to step into that Isaiah 61 anointing where the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me to preach good news and to bind up the brokenhearted it starts right there that's what he actually starts that whole message with is for the shabbat uh for the shattered minds and the truly shattered minds the most shattered minds are those who've actually been through systematic trauma traumatizing abuse and that's exactly what satanic ritualistic abuse is and it's very interesting to me that jesus starts that out you know he quotes in luke 4 he quotes isaiah 61 and says um, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor and to bind up the brokenhearted, the Shabbat. So yeah. this is crazy that you went through this, but what started to unfold, you know, as, as your memory started coming back, as your story continues. Yeah. So um, after those initial memories, then I started to have memories of being in a um, like having photos taken of me and, and things and filmed and it was really puzzling but I discovered then well I realized that he was part of a pornography group as well and then he um dad was so he he was part of an international company I won't mention which one but um but he had visitors international visitors and um, and he would have dinner parties and have them over, and and I I hated them and I never knew why, you know. And I just thought that I was put being put on show. Oh, here's my daughter, you know, here's my daughter. And then I had a memory of being taken taken out of the house and um, being given to these two guys to do whatever they wanted with me and being. I don't know, tied to a bed and all sorts of, you know, horrific stuff. So it just, the depravity of what he had been involved in just deepened and deepened. Um, and then, like, as, as I went on, it, the memories got worse, but I think that was because God's so gracious. I mean, he didn't bring anything of this up while, um, while I was living near my family, which is wonderful. He knew when I was ready, even though I don't, I didn't think I was ready, um, but he brought it up and he just brought them up gradually. As I got stronger, you know, they got more awful and the whole, but he did, he wanted me to see what actually happened. You know, the real truth, you, could, you can't know, you can't get free unless you know the truth. And um, they are, all this trauma is just embedding lies, was embedding lies inside me. And I just went under them all. And especially about God, I thought, oh, God doesn't love me. And I I cried out to him as a child when I was, um, I don't know, about eight or something. And like, God, you've got to stop this, you know, help me, help me. And he didn't, in my mind, he didn't stop me. He wasn't there. He about so I thought, right, that's it. I'm not having anything to do with you, God. Yeah, um, that, so that's were... really that's really interesting as well because mm. you know, uh, out of the four people so far in the in the series that we've interviewed, you know, you're the third person who yeah. formed you know, your really your key image of who God is through your uh, through your abuse. <laughs> You're yes, like this must yeah. be who God is. Like you know, it's mm. um getting that really embedding that false understanding of God, especially the Father. You know, like our image of the Father yeah. is like ah, oh, like you've abandoned me. You don't care. So yeah, um, yeah. So going forward, um, what what began to unfold for you <laughs> from here? 
So, I mean, in life, I, I just fell into a big black hole and I, we were pastoring our first church at the time. And, um, and so I, I started seeing, I had a friend who was a doctor and so he was like, come and see. Wait, 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 uh, pause. Let's, let's rewind. Let's rewind a little bit. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you didn't go from, uh, yeah. So, so it was while you were pastoring that you're starting to get these memories back. Yes. Yep. Okay. Let's go, let's go back then. Um, somehow in your darkness and your depression and this you somehow meet Jesus what happens how did you meet Jesus oh I would um so I when I was a teenager I became a Christian and I was full a full-on Christian and um and then I left for a while and then I came back for a while but I was a full-on Christian and we were in ministry and everything. I'm like, I trust you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Like there was all this, you know, I was doing all the right stuff in my head, but I didn't realize my heart was saying, uh-uh, no way. Jesus is a man. We can't trust men. He's not getting anywhere near me. So I just, I guess it was religion, you know. Okay. So, religion. I mean, this is this is really interesting in terms of what we've been covering so far regarding surrender. So where would you say your heart no. was at in relation to that scary, terrifying word of surrender? Oh, no way. I would not, never. No, no. I had to be in control. Mm -hmm. There was so much fear in my life, you know, and especially as things started to open up, I had just more fear and fear of people touching me and like, you know, I'd freak, I'd have triggers and have panic attacks. And if a man walked behind me, you know, this sort of thing. So God was not getting close to me. <laughs> okay. So we've even one of the pictures that we've kind of talked about in the orphan illusion, right? And this is probably pretty fitting of where you were, is that it's like being in a dungeon in the darkest deepest part you know in terms of yeah. you yourself it's like you're a prisoner in a in the deepest darkest type of dungeon in a city that is completely overrun with darkness and chaos but it's a city that you were actually born to rule and reign in you know yeah. so, like, so you're in the deep in this dungeon the deepest darkest part of your own heart all the walls you know really like walls up fortresses up it's dark yeah. it's lonely but in that place there's no lovers getting in there, no. right? No, there's no authentic love because, nope. um, you know, we can't even have, we can't have authentic relationship without genuine transparency and vulnerability. No. So the relationships that you were experiencing, how deep were they at that time? To, to start with, not at all. But then I, I ended up connecting with other people who were depressed and suicidal. Like I was sort of attracted people like that. Oh, I always have. But we would just jump in the darkness together, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're all depressed. And how would you kill yourself? Well, I'd do this. And how would you kill yourself? You know, oh, wow. it's just oh, such a region of captivity. And was were those types of conversations conversations you were having with other Christians? yes yeah so you gathered together all these yeah. depressed suicidal christians <laughs> talking about how you'd kill yourself uh that i mean that's it's that to me is just really heartbreaking that we can have that in our in our christian culture yeah uh yeah. when we're we're invited and to live oh, yeah. in the bliss of sonship we're, we're invited to live in an unbroken yeah, yeah. uh this unbroken seamless union with the trinity that that's what we're born for called for created for but here we are ending up with this culture that's justified such a terrible state of existence were people like noticing right away was it obvious that things weren't right for you like what was going what was going on like how do people interact with you and see you when you're in that real dark place well it, it was interesting because people would not ask how i was <laughs> or well if they did i'd be like i'm fine 
I'm fine. Yeah. But I wasn't, I wasn't going to say, well, I just feel like jumping off a bridge right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm a pastor's wife, seriously. Was well, like, I mean, you obviously, so, so at what age, so you're a teenager and you give your life to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And then how long before you get married? How old were you when you got married? I was 22, 21, okay. 22. 21, 22. Yeah. Now, here's a real problem, fam. And if you've got young people out there, they need to be doing this course, right? Because definitely. Uh, oh, definitely. Because Christian Bad young people this. get married, you know, right? Get married, 21, 22. Yeah, we did youth group. We did, we've been to church, but very, very few have ever you know, systematically gone through and, you know, and worked on inner healing, yeah. worked on transformation, worked on understanding, hey, like, how am I doing psychologically, you know, as a human? How's my conscious, subconscious, unconscious thoughts? How is that in alignment with truth? Do I have, need to renew my mind? How renewed yeah. is my mind? Because you are asking for chaos if you bring people together who are living in the orphan illusion, right? The whole definition of the orphan illusion is the inability to receive divine love yes the inability yeah. to give perfect expression to divine love and i mean my definition of what heaven on earth is right because that's our calling right bring heaven on earth there's the mandate bring heaven to earth um that's what jesus taught us you know in matthew 6 your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven that's us right but if you if you want to really be an architect of heaven on earth, you have to understand what the blueprint is that you're trying to build, that you're trying to reproduce. And the, the blueprint for heaven on earth is, it's not angels and fluffy ducks. There's something deeper, which is the blueprint, which is the epicenter of the entire atmosphere of heaven. It's the engine room of every good thing that we desire about heaven that engine room, the epicenter is the fellowship of the Trinity. It's an unbroken cycle of divine love. It's perichoresis. It's the divine dance, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit receiving and expressing divine love perfectly. Wow, that right there, that is heaven on earth. And so if we're going to be those who bring heaven to earth and create authentic expressions of heaven on earth, it is an authentic expression of heaven on earth is it has to be expressed in the context of relationship it has to be expressed in the context of of a relationship where unbroken cycles of divine love are being shared amongst each other but mm. uh when you get married how much unbroken cycle of divine love are you living in <laughs> Uh, my walls were up so much that I, I picked a man who's also walls were up, no intimacy, basically. And so I, I thought he's rescuing me from my dad, my family, I'm out of here. And that's like frying pan into the fire. <laughs> Seriously, it was I was married for 29 years because I'm like, I made those vows. I'm I'm keeping this, you know, I persevered and persevered, but I mean, we and we had good times, but it was basically an abusive marriage. So, um, and yeah, he and he couldn't even really support me in my healing journey either. I was fighting him all the way, um, and what, in the and end, it just broke. And in I, what way would you say it was an abusive relationship? That he would. Um, well, he would just really put me down. It was more verbally mm -hmm. and like covert, like hidden. Mm -hmm. And he would undermine me. Um, just like he was very likable and personable. But then in, in private, he would be undermining. And um, he was always right. And my opinions um, weren't, weren't right. And he, what I loved about him was that he flirted with me, you know, made me feel so special. And, and that's why I got pulled in. But then he flirted with every woman <laughs> and it didn't matter what happened. You know, he got in trouble with that for quite a few times, but, but he just could not see it. And you know, so when you talk it. about getting in trouble, is that, are you talking about affairs? What are you... Yeah, yeah, affairs and accusations. 
coming against him and saying that's wrong that's not my fault and yeah you know. so so you you live through multiple affairs in your marriage as well yes yeah yeah okay so this fam this is something to be really like taken to heart here's a couple that are completely dysfunctional they got multiple affairs going on they got this kind of passive aggressive weird um destructive relationship going on and someone somewhere thinks it's a fantastic idea idea for them to be pastoring a church yeah right yeah yeah like how <laughs> are, how are these like how the heck does that pass for know. like okay sweet these, let's put these people in charge now right yeah. because your i mean your your marriage was a complete mess yes your marriage is a complete mess. I mean, what were you guys even teaching in church? What did you have to give? Well, we did. I did have something to give. I Well, I really, I mean, he was quite religious. So yeah. he, taught, he taught the Bible, basically. But there was no Holy Spirit. And I, um, I was very vulnerable with the women. And we, yeah, and it did... Yeah, we did. <laughs> you got me on the spot there. Um, yeah, I mean, we did some really good ministry, but it it just came out of brokenness. Yeah, yeah I'm, and there's so many people in that place, right? Beautiful, beautiful hearts, doing yeah. their very best, but they yeah, haven't yeah. been on an inner healing journey, and there's just so much trauma. And I mean, it's yeah, it's pretty rife. So. It's really good that we bring that up and just talk about that because I talk all, you know, so often about dysfunction in the church and there's just like a really mm. good example of that. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. it's around this time then that you know, you're in ministry, you're married, you've, got a, you've had your kids now. Is it you know, when you've had your kids that your memories start coming back and this journey starts really going deep? Yes, yeah, yeah. They were in middle school at the time. So mm. how old were you roughly? I think I was, I think it was 30s. Yeah, I was around 30 or so. <clears throat> I didn't actually know that you could get memories back because I was crying out and crying out to God because I knew there was something there. You know, there was, I just, I tried counselling, psychology. I even went to new age stuff and it just would not break. And then I, um, <clears throat> I had all these fear in my life and I went on an Emmaus walk and, and they said, oh, you can have some ministry with this couple. And I I had this theophostic ministry as well. That, um, Justin the last, mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, that what he was session. talking about. And in that, uh, God brought up a memory. And in that memory, I was nine years old and I was going into the neighbours, like a big cubby house. And when I went in there, there were... Um, there were like eight, eight boys. And and in the memory, I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta get out of here. But it was too late, I couldn't get out. And then they, they were starting to chase me and they were chasing me around the room. And I knew, I knew what was coming with those guys. And um, and then they brought Jesus, like there when they're working with me, they brought Jesus into that space. And to start with, I, I was like, Oh, actually, first, God was very angry. He was so angry with them that he chased them out of the room. And um, and I laughed. This is perfect. I laughed. He's got so much righteous anger about what's happening to his children. And, um, and then they said, well, Jesus can come to you. He can take you out of there. I'm like, no, no, he's not coming near me. He's a man. And then... It's funny when you're in that state of like as a child, they said to me, but Jesus came all the way just to rescue you. And I just took that in as a child and I, I believed, I believed Jesus. And I went, oh, okay, that's okay then. And he came and he just picked me up really tenderly, brought me to his chest and he took me out to somewhere safe. And after that, all the fear was gone, like wow. completely gone. It was a complete miracle. Wow. I mean, um, there was more later. There was more later because yeah. there are more memories. But yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's layers and layers and layers. 
yeah, layers yeah. and layers and layers. And yeah. actually, when I've walked with a lot of people through this, essentially what happens is it's like pulling a string, right? You don't even know it's there. And then all of a sudden yeah. there's something that happens that God brings it up, opens the door and says, it's time yeah. to start dealing with this. And it's like pulling yeah. a string. And as soon as you start pulling it, all, oh, baby, like, all those memories are just going to start, uh, start coming. Yeah. So uh, you can't stop them. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, you know, from what I'm hearing from you and some of the story, you know, that you shared with me previously, essentially you ended up in a pedophile ring. Yes. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what can you share a little bit about, you know, what that, I mean, obviously we got an idea of what that involves, but how long, or do you have any of the details on that? I didn't, I didn't really get many details. I just, the, um, I mean, as a real, as a small child, that memory that I had of the flashes. So I'm like, what is that? Oh, people are taking photos. And, and I was like, mom, I want my mom. Where's my mom? And, um, and they brought that question to the Lord. Where was, where was mom? And then I, I saw her in the corner and she had been drugged there in the corner so yeah that was it was extremely hard it's like all little kids want their mum yeah (laughs) yeah so this whole dynamic I mean this went on for years for you Mm. I actually I'm just amazed at the way that we um delude ourselves or protect ourselves because I thought that it finished at nine years old. So after that gang rape, um, and I thought we we moved away from that area and I thought, oh, that was it. So in that in that memory, you know, when you were being chased around, that there was that was a gang rape situation that unfolded. Yeah. I had more of the memory later on when I was stronger. Yeah. I could cope with it. Yeah, yeah. And it involved my my friends were part of like in that as well. This is part of the thing is that um, that when you when I got memories, I thought I am crazy. This this could not have happened. This is just crazy. The satanic stuff. This is cra- I am insane. This could not have happened. But but I I had an experience with my dad years like years and years years later where he he thought I was going around telling everyone what it, what he had done and and he was denying and denying and denying but within that he validated that memory and he said that the like girls in the neighborhood were going to this house for sex down in my street just down like it was two doors from me and um and he wasn't admitting that that was abuse. And I confronted him and I said, that's like, that's sexual abuse, dad. But, um, but it was confirmed. So I was really grateful for that. Yeah. Um, there's another whole dimension as well to the satanic ritualistic abuse. And I don't know if we want to, touch much on that but some of the memories there um fam if we do go onto this i'm not sure if we will but if we do this is kind of a like you might have to have a strong stomach if we touch on here um so i'm a little bit i'm a little bit hesitant to go there all the way just because it's so horrific um for people and Mm. um not sure that people really want to be aware of some of the horrors but let's maybe let's maybe not include any details here but there in terms of the satanic ritualistic abuse I mean and yours is not the first story I've heard of this I've heard a lot but there is sacrifices involved there's ceremonies involved there are some pretty hideous um processes involved yeah yeah what they are what they are doing is they are creating hell on earth so god says to in the um 
in the prayer. We have to say, bring heaven to earth. Well, Satan is trying to bring hell onto earth. And it's similar to what happened in, in the Nazis in the camps where they were they were killing people. They didn't just shoot them where they were. They took them all to a place and then they tortured them and they killed them all. And the, the terror, the enemy feeds off that terror. And that's what the Satanists are doing. They're getting power out of those, out of the terror and the blood spilt and um, the rituals. I mean, we, um, we have rituals, we have baptism, and we um communion we communion, <laughs> communion they, which is, is blood <laughs> yeah 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 and they're basically twisting that they even twist the crucifixion so they're they want to twist everything that jesus said and that and that he did okay so let's start fast tracking towards memories starting to come back and you start getting a little bit of healing how does this how did it work for you to actually come out of the depths of this chaos and actually start coming into a place where you start getting a little bit of momentum towards freedom? Mm. It was amazing, actually. I just, I woke up one day and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm not suicidal. I'm not depressed. And I was so excited. I guess I was shocked because I just thought I'd be in it forever, this healing journey. I think it took about seven years um, of that. And I was, I got to the point where I was ministering to myself. So I didn't have to ring up every time something happened, but I'm ministering to myself. And, and that, that's a really good point, fam. You know, even from what you've heard, just in this course alone, you'll be able to actually pick up a lot of the secrets and the keys and the tools for inner healing. At the core of it, what it is, is it's simply exchanging a lie for the truth. Yep. And it's pretty simple. You break agreement with the lie. I, look, I break that. I renounce it. So you're going to break agreement with it. You're going to renounce it. All renouncing means is I refuse to agree with this. I have no, I have no agreement with this whatsoever. And you, so you're breaking agreement, you're renouncing the lie that you've believed, and I accept the truth, um, you know, that Jesus is giving you. So it's, mm. it's always actually at the core of it, it's that simple, exchanging a lie for the truth. And there's different tools that, you know, you might use or that yeah. you might pick up that enable you to sometimes go real deep, real fast. But at the same, at the core of it, that's what's happening. So yeah, pay, we want to pay real attention as well to, the Venus story and see if you can pick up any keys of how she was able to exchange deep, deep lies for truth. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Every ministry that I've been involved in actually, and learned trained in is it's, that's the core thing, the lies, the lies. And we build structures on those lies, which were my walls. And in, in some ways, I was frightened and I'm saying everybody's going to hurt me and abandon me, but my walls are actually were making it happen. So they are keeping me isolated and they confirmed the lies. They were self-fulfilling prophecies. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So saying really didn't have to do anything. I did. Like, I'll just keep it going. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's a big deal. You know, like if you believe a lie, you empower the liar. Yeah. If you mm. believe a lie, you empower the liar. So essentially, uh, mm -hmm. what Satan tries to do to destroy our lives is first of all get us to believe a lie. And if we'll be believe a lie, and here's the biggest lie: if we can be believe a lie um, that God is like Satan, which is what Satan's always trying to convince you of, right? Oh uh, yeah, God's like me, <laughs> right? God's a complete scumbag. If you can believe, if you believe that one lie, which you know, Davina did, Renee did. <laughs> Uh, Marlene did you you will build your whole life your whole everything will get built off that line that lie there is sing, it's the single most powerful lie is having a false image of God and all trauma is ultimately aimed at causing you to come into agreement with a false image of who God is and then once you have a false image of who God is the next thing that comes on that is a false image of your own identity if yes. you've got those two lies in place, a false image of God and a false image of your own identity, at that point, 
Uh, you are perfectly positioned to live in the orphan illusion until yeah. you break those two lies, yeah. right? As long as you've got those two lies in place, a false image of God and a false understanding of your identity, you will live in the orphan illusion. You will be the author of your own chaos. You will be your own worst enemy. There's an African proverb that, proverb that says, if there is no enemy within, the enemy without can do you no harm. Yeah. But if there is an enemy within in your own belief systems, Satan can go on holiday. He can be you know, sipping back on cocktails in the Bahamas and you'll ruin your own life all by yourself. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. It's like a tree because like that, that lie, that fear was my roots and I built on that. And the fruit, the fruit is like addiction, isolation, you know, all, all these things. And we don't look at the fruit and start to deal with that. We've got to go right down to the root. And that how that happened for me really was um, letting my heart speak. So letting my heart acknowledge that I don't trust you, Jesus. You're going to hurt me. Like you can't start anywhere until you actually know what your heart believes. And then um, and then God can come in. Jesus can come in and speak to that and speak to that. And then, um, yeah, once you pull out the root, the whole lot. Like, yeah, down. absolutely. <laughs> hey, let's talk. Let's talk for a moment. I mean, this is where um, well, I think you're so on point with that. You know, we've, this is one of the things we've been saying. Wherever there's fruit, there's always a root. Yeah. Right? And. I mean that's that's why I make uh, that why I'm so confident in making that claim that you know Adam and Eve were living as spiritual orphans before the fall. How can you tell? Because they fell. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they fell, right? There, there's the fruit right there. Because they yeah. fell. What is that fruit? And wherever there's fruit, there's what there's a root. And Jesus is the exact opposite of that, right? He's like, okay, well you've seen in the garden what dysfunction looks like and what the orphan illusion looks like let me show you what sonship looks like and what happens when satan uh, tempts jesus he gets a beat down every single time you know like if if adam and eve were walking in their sonship as soon as that snake came in the garden boom they would have grabbed it by the tail crack, cracked its neck thrown it out of the garden because they were yeah. their, their their mandate was to be you know, to be caretakers, stewards, kaitiaki, have dominion over the garden, not to let, you know, you know, Satan come waltzing around and having his, uh, having a good time in there. So let's talk root, uh, let's talk root and fruit. So for you, mm. some of the fruit, some of the behavior that you're like, oh, this is dysfunctional behavior that was obvious, you know, like sin, um, chaos. I mean, you've got depression, there's a fruit right there, suicidal yeah. thoughts, there's a fruit right there walls up there's a fruit right there living in shame isolation there's a fruit right there shame. Um, what about oh, behavioral stuff so Pardon? Shame, shame and that feeling of being filthy you know yeah filthy and it's my fault it's all my fault my marriage is my fault and I'm no good that was yeah. like all the ugh, yuck stuff rejection yeah so you had all those feelings before you got married how was like were you an angel? Did you behave well? Were you chaos? Like, what was your, what were you like? Well, I had this good girl thing happening. So I was just so good until I was about 17 and 17 and a half. And then I left the church and I just fell the other way. And I was so needy. I just like needed love. So then I started sleeping around with guys and um, just and drinking. And I just thought I was having fun. Oh, I'm just having fun in the world, you know. But now, you know, as I got older, I looked back and I saw um, I was escaping. I was trying to escape and trying to meet those needs. And I, like, that's the need that God puts in a hole inside us that only he can fill. And I'm trying to fill it with all these, like, guys and sex and drink and and stuff like that it doesn't work yeah i mean there's there's a dynamic as well that there's a real deep pain happening in you and you're trying to anesthetize it with something yeah. you had a crack with religion to try and anesthetize yeah, the pain yep. there whatever mm. happened you quit on that for a bit you went and tried something else um yep. that didn't work out so well then you end up coming back to church and getting married try and anesthetize this pain with marriage you thought your husband yes. was going to save you right yeah yeah true and, and that didn't work out so well no, no. So, I mean, 
back to transformation, back to what started working, what's, you know, like you would start getting a little bit of breakthrough. Um, yeah. And then obviously at some point, I mean, you said you'd been working on it for like seven years. Uh, so it's taken some, taken a bunch of time. You're doing amazing in this story because you're not quitting, you know, like that's the biggest key. Well, There's so much know. courage required. This, this comes some from somewhere that I will not quit. I yeah. will not quit. It's like my, my t-shirt. It's like, brave, brave. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, I was not. I was just not going to quit. And I'm still like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I actually chased down healing so much that um, I, I read books. I read books to trigger myself <laughs> so that I could work through all the triggers. I just wanted to get through it really quickly and start ministering to people. But, but then I had to get through the marriage so the stronger that I got um the more healed I got the more my marriage shook because I'm changing and I'm not a doormat anymore and I'm standing up for myself and you know that wasn't the way that things were in our marriage before yeah, that I mean, your your marriage was a codependent relationship right yes yeah, yeah you had to be submissive and you had to say yes and toe the line and yeah. as long as you were the submissive one and your husband was the dominant one, things were okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But as soon as you wanted to have a voice, yeah. as soon as you wanted to become a powerful person and stop being dominated, mm -hmm. that would have been, you know, like warfare, like just yeah. war, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, things got a lot worse. <laughs> How did this doormat get a voice? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He would say that um, he wished that I'd just go back to the how I was when we were married. <laughs> I don't think Completely yeah, I'm sure. depressed, suicidal. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, well, I didn't tell him all of that stuff back then, but yeah, yeah, just the doormat. Yeah. Yeah, but as you start getting healed and start discovering you're a powerful person, the mm. relationships around you, and this is a crazy thing, right? When we start getting healed and going on a journey and, and waking up to dysfunction and realizing that, hey, this is an unhealthy culture. This is an unhealthy relationship. All of a sudden, actually, we can get a lot of kickback, right? So you can be Ooh, like yes. kicked in the face. You're like getting on this healing journey. You're being so courageous and you think the yeah. world's going to reward you for being, yeah. wow, look at the You're amazing courage. Look at you. <laughs> and instead of celebrating you, you got all these people who are hating on you because they don't, they can't control you anymore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or telling you, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, when you like your visions and your dreams, you can't do that. I'm like, Far out. <laughs> um, so your marriage eventually ends, but in this process, you're actually doing better than you've ever done in your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I feel really sad about marriages. And, and them ending and I'm pro-marriage but when my marriage ended I took off completely I was completely free then and this is four years ago we're talking now so I just started taking off and um just you know going to getting involved in um charismatic churches and learning prophecy and getting dreams and visions and this whole world in the spirit that I did not know anything about it was yeah it's just amazing for you uh, on this journey what would you say have been some of the biggest tools to bring freedom <clears throat> You know, just tool, tools that you've picked up yeah. along the way um, that have really helped you to, to really step into freedom? I think um, I mean the word of the Lord is the biggest one and even when I would I would meditate on the word and um, and I wouldn't believe it but then Jesus coming to me and speaking it to me, I believed him and that, re that really changed things. And now the word is really rich and I, I believe it. I can declare it and uh, meditate on it and it keeps building me up because things can still shake, you know, things can still wobble me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the, the word was the biggest thing. And that corrects the lies. 
and that builds a new that new foundation. But I but I think that letting letting the heart speak, really knowing like what what was inside, that was really big. I could never have done anything if I didn't identify that. That mm. there's um what do you call it when you had mine? It, it was not lined up. My heart and my head was not lined up. <laughs> So what actually what I was speaking when I was in religion was a lie, which is a it's a breach. Like I'm I was lying, I didn't really know, but I was, you know, lying, saying, I'm singing, I trust God and I worship you, and you're good, you're always good. And inside I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, that's how <laughs> that's exactly how I felt mm. when I read John 17 and Jesus said you know, uh, I have loved you, you know, the, that God has loved us, loved me with the same love that he has for Jesus. I was like, that's rubbish. There's no way that, you know, G, that I, that the father loves me with the same love that he has for Jesus. Jesus's performance was 10 out of 10. Mine is not going to even hit a one. Mm. And so Jesus gets the perfect 10 out of 10 love. And I'm lucky if I get the scraps. Yeah. Because my whole psychology and my whole life was wired around performance-based love. Mm. So I was like, huh? But we'll say all these things. We'll say all these things, like maybe at this level, but really at like a heart level, do I really believe that? Or is there going to come a come a moment when I'm reading the, the Bible and all of a sudden realize, okay, I'm caught in a crossfire here because I confess it with my mouth, right? I believe the Bible. I believe I'm a good Christian. I believe the Bible. The Bible speaks something that my heart is like, Rah, whatever, I hate that. And I'm like, what, what is that inside me? Like, what is that? It's like, oh, that's your whole lifetime of performance-based love. Yeah. <laughs> performance-based acceptance. It's your whole lifetime. That's like, that's everything. That's your whole religious system that you live in. That's the gospel that you preach. That's your, that's your whole mentality and psychology coming, yeah. you know, colliding with the word of God that, you know, and the word of God saying, no, you're rubbish. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, boom, yeah, a big spark yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that God is good. That's the biggest thing because you see so much suffering and children hurting and, and like, how can he allow that? Like, how can God be good? But but he's not, he's not a slave. Like he's not a, um, he's, we're not slaves. We, everybody has free will. All those, those Satanists, they have free will. And, and I've forgiven them all and forgiven my father too, which that's a whole nother story. But, um, but I had, I had this memory once and I, I won't say what it was, but a really hectic memory. And I was just covered in this slime stuff and I was, it was like I was dead and he showed me, he came and he was kneeling over me and he was crying and his tears were washing me clean in that memory. And that's what he is doing when we are being abused and bad things are happening to us. He's right there with us mm -hmm. and his heart is breaking. His heart is breaking just as so much as ours, ours does. He feels yeah. it all. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I want to just really encourage everyone with in this journey is that the process, right? Of Even what you said there is like, it used to be hard for you to believe, but now it's easy. Mm. Yeah. The thing that's changed there, fam, is the softness of her heart. Yeah. Right? It's really difficult for a hard heart to believe the word of God. It's really hard. It's really difficult for a hard heart to believe that God is good. You know, it's almost impossible for a hard heart to believe that God is good. And if it's, if you're struggling to believe that God is perfect, that God is love, uh, that God is good, um, or you're struggling to believe that you're perfect, you know, if you're struggling to believe that you're perfectly made in the image of God, listen, that's a uh, hardness of heart. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why Paul starts Ephesians 3, you know, like that whole Ephesians 3 uh, passage that I was reading about yesterday about, you know, being founded and grounded and rooted and established on love and not merely um, 
you know, not merely a knowledge of love, but a practical experience of the supernatural love of God that transcends me and knowledge without experience, because this being baptized in the love of God, like coming uh, into encounter with Jesus, coming into true authentic relationship is going to soften your heart. But so do all your daily disciplines, you know, the sacred rhythms that you have of, hey, praying in the spirit. You might think, oh, what does praying in the spirit do? You know, like, especially when you first start praying in the spirit, you'll be like, I'm pretty sure I'm I don't, not necessarily noticing anything happening here. But I tell you what, there's a process that will you'll activate when you start praying in the spirit. And that's, first of all, uh, you'll have like conviction, right? Uh, this is something that I went through countless times. Praying in the spirit, you get conviction. Conviction of what? Anything that's out of alignment, right? Uh, any root of hardness of heart, any root of bitterness, even any root of brokenness, anything like anything that's out of alignment with the divine life the Holy Spirit will bring that up when you start praying in the spirit and he'll bring up the peripheral stuff first, right? He cleans from the outside in. He's just like, oh, we'll just tidy up this other stuff. That's why you can, you know, be following Jesus for 10 years and then all of a sudden go, what? Like, how did you not like bring up this horrendous dysfunction in my life? Is that like, I was just, you know, like warming you up, you know, like we've been we were warming up on this journey. So um, conviction is the one of the first things that you're going to notice, right? Okay, conviction um, like and that will flip and hurt you'll be like ah there's something in me isn't like perfect and when I you one thing to be really clear about when you hear me saying you're perfect is one of the fundamental uh, elements that I was talking about in the journey is that there is a an unholy fusion fusion between identity and behavior now God doesn't see your identity and your behavior as the same thing they aren't the same thing you have to understand that identity, uh, that is who you are. Behavior is what you do. And, you know, behavior, experiences, all of those things have no authority to redefine what God has exclusively defined in his image. So your identity is set in stone. Whether you have your best day or your worst day, your identity is set in stone. You're perfectly made in the image of God. Now, your behavior, it might be absolute rubbish, but guess what happened? Yeah, guess what? Until you start to believe that you're perfect, you'll relate, your behavior is not going to shift, right? As, as long as you want to hold on to false identities and that define you falsely and believe lies about who you are, they will uh, manifest in fruit of dysfunction, right? So wherever there's a root, there's a fruit. So it's not until you come into agreement with the fact, hey, you are perfect. You're made in his image that um that that when you change the root which is your belief you swap a lie for the truth then you can start having the fruit of the divine life all over you um but the softening of our hearts so much of the softening of our hearts can happen through our sacred daily rhythms and when we put those beautiful sacred daily rhythms in place and that's what the uh, 21 day hard things challenge is designed to do is to help you understand what sacred things do you need to be put in place on a daily basis you know what sacred rhythms do you need that will fast track the softening of your heart so that you know because your heart um your heart won't do religion your mind might but your heart won't play any silly games right your heart just won't play any silly games so your heart will always be real now the only way that you can stop your heart from speaking what's real and authentic is to shut it up but if it's going to be able to speak in any way, it's going to speak what's real and what's true. And it will not do religion, it'll only do real. <laughs> so we have to really soften our heart so that your heart will believe. Yeah, that's so true. If if you shut it, you will make yourself sick, <laughs> physically and mentally sick. So that's the beautiful thing too. As we heal and our mind heals, our body heals as well. So all this sickness that I had, it, that just went as well. Wow. Talk to us a little bit more about that. What sickness did you have and, and what changed? Oh, just the stress. So the stress in my body caused so much, you know, and the tension. Um, I can't even really remember now. It just feels like so long ago. <laughs> That's nice, eh? Yeah. It's so nice when you start to forget Here's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I'm starting to forget what it feels like to hate myself. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
It's fun. Hey, Jesus. Good <laughs> <laughs> is God. Seriously. Yeah. In fact, not just oh. starting to, it's possible I may have forgotten what it feels like <laughs> to take myself. Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten what that, all that pain was like. Even getting the memories back, it was so painful. And now I'm just so full of joy. <laughs> it's like joy coming out and and people comment and see that how are you so full of joy it's it's sort of like when you've been through the darkest refining fire the darker and the hotter it is that you suffer in that way the more joy you end up having and the more yeah freedom. <laughs> yeah this is this is love's revenge right love running yeah, into the yeah. darkest places and you know, I, I think that you are a trophy for the kingdom of God. This is Jesus, you know, on a like yeah. on a war parade coming home with the spoils of war. Like, yes, Davina, yeah. I got another one. I got yeah. another one out of the depths of darkness and fam, that's for you too. You know, wherever you are, whatever. Um, and you know, people have been messaging me as well about their transformation journeys or what they're scared of or their secret sins or their deepest fears and the places they're stuck or the strongholds that they've got or the walls they've put up or uh, the isolation and the shame they feel. Well, this is for you. Uh, freedom's coming for you. Love is coming for you. And love is going to find you. Love is going to liberate you. Love is going to bind up the brokenheartedness in you at the very depths uh, and the very core of your being. Um, Davina, as we start to wrap up now, um, mm. any final thoughts for people on, hey, if they are going to fast track, you know, if they want to do something, that can help them heal faster, renew their mind faster. What what works for you consistently on this journey? Um, I think taking the thoughts captive, that if you're very diligent with that, and and when you if you're triggered, then there's a to it there's a reason why so then uh if you go and you map that map that about why what happened why you're feeling that um what you know what is happening within you and where did you first feel it um yeah if uh, let me give you let me give you a funny story on that okay so i'm pastoring yeah. now i'm this is a story of me being a dysfunctional pastor <laughs> the early days of me being a uh, being a pastor um, one of the interns cut my finger off. Look at that. That's uh, my hand. Like, oh, I didn't know that. There you go. That's uh, that's how it is on Zoom. You don't always see that someone's had their finger cut off. Well, there you go. One of the interns, it was the last log of the day. I was loading up the machine and he just wasn't concentrating, right? He wasn't concentrating and he pulls a hydraulic lever and fortunately he didn't cut my whole hand off. My hand was right in the machine. I just lost a... Uh, you know, the top of my finger. Um, <laughs> I'd been preaching on grace. So I was like, okay, here's a little practical moment for me. Uh, anyway, oh funny, a uh, couple of funny bits to this. They they took me to the, you know, emergency, you know, well, just to the, actually, we just had a medical center. We lived in the most remote town in New Zealand. So there's not really an emergency department. There's a medical center. You know, you're lucky if people aren't wearing gumboots. And the lady there, the nurse, she put the, um, she put the needle with the morphine in through into my finger, but all the way through the and out the other side. And then just squeeze, it's just squeezing the morphine all over the floor. I was like, hey, I've never won that. Like, <laughs> and then I had a two hour drive to the hospital and waited for hours and hours and hours in the um for them to do something. And anyway, uh the it was all swollen and mangled and it's still a bit mangled looks a little bit like a wild dog chewed on it but um there was this lady in the church and oh my gosh she wound me up something crazy right because she just would go on and on about this finger and how no one could marry uh no one would want to marry someone with a finger like that I'm single at the time you know I was single when I started pastoring and she was just like go on and on about it I was like whoa would this lady shut up like because like lady can you just shut up but she just wouldn't like every time I saw her she'd be like ah like make a crazy over the top 
dramatic deal and it like it built like I didn't have a trigger there before but man after this lady was done I had a trigger I was ready to go and also because I had a bit of a rejection wound so it like um it built on top of my rejection wound like uh this lady saying no one could ever marry who would ever marry you know someone with a finger like that I'm like and then we're at this gathering of all the young adults at them um, at the pastor's house I didn't think that the pastors were actually there but I was there and um, we had all the young adults there and one of them just started mouthing off about my finger and you know I could <laughs> no one ever want to marry you I was like ah and I um I just uh, I gave her the fingers rah, like that you know like uh and that really ruined the night quite badly things just like melted it just the whole atmosphere you know going from like hey happy time with all the young adults now the past is giving people the fingers and this went crashed um that lady she had her own rejection wounds and she thought I said something that I didn't say as well and anyway it just completely capitulated um so the next day I was like oh my gosh something's going on what's going on to me so the next day I set aside eight hours and I just had a prayer day and that just was Jesus just went you know because it's fruit and root I'm like oh my gosh I've got this big fruit manifesting what's the root and Jesus just took, took me deep all the way there and, and exposed the rejection wound, healed the rejection wound, um, you know, set me up to, you know, sort relationship out and tidy the mess out that I'd made. Uh, but yeah, it was that <laughs> trace, face and replace. Wherever there's a fruit, there's a root. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Davina, back to you. Any other um thoughts there on hot tips for people acceleration I'm, I'm I can see I'm in a real um, season of acceleration but I actually I would really like to press into the Lord about acceleration in this area because I know there are not many ministries that deal with dissociative identities disorder which is like multiple personality disorder um and mine was my journey was fast tracked seven years and some people never even get there but I just believe that there must be a quicker less painful way yeah yeah I'll tell you a little bit about what that is all right like there, there is the journey of inner healing doesn't have a set timeline all right there's no set timeline on how long it has to take the thing that dictates that is your humility mm -hmm right? So it's the level of humility that you live in that dictates how quickly you get free because the process of getting free is simply how long will it take you to finally agree with God about who you are? Yeah, yeah. And you completely know? open up your heart to him. How long will it take you and, because, and how long will it take you to finally agree that God is who he says he is? Mm. because when you finally agree that God is who he says he is what you'll realize is that he's safe he's the perfect one to surrender to yeah and you, you if you can't surrender completely to God right if God like you were saying before ah Jesus is the man right well there's a lie there that's causing you to believe that God's unsafe mm. right and that puts a massive wall up so until we believe that God is who he says he is, mm. and until we believe that we are who God says we are, yeah. then we will never change. You know, things won't change. Things will be slow. In order to do that, we're gonna, we have to surrender. The thing that we have to surrender is we have to surrender our right to define reality. Mm. We have to give that over exclusively to God. And this is actually even the tr eating from the tree of knowledge, right? Part of eating from the tree of knowledge is taking on ourselves the right to judge ourselves, to be our own judges. We actually have to hand over that right to be our own judges, hand that right back to God and say, hey, God, you're, you're, you're the one who judges me. You're the one who uh, you get to judge yourself. You get to judge me. I'm going to stop being the judge. I'm going to stop trying to, because what the judge is doing is defining reality. I'm going to try, I'm going to stop defining reality and let you define me. So there's this element of the softness and of our hearts. There's a few key things here. One is actually having a blueprint. And this is what we're trying to restore here as a blueprint, because 
for so long in churches, the blueprint was so messed up that all people did was go round and round and get no results because they didn't know where they were going. Listen, here's where you're going. You're flipping perfect, all right? You're made in the image of God. He did a perfect job. You're exclusively defined by him. And God is good. God is love. He's perfect in every way. You're not going to find a flaw in him. You're not going to find uh, any accusation that will stick. You're not going to find any unsafe behaviors. All you're going to find through and through is love and perfection and goodness and kindness and wonder and awe. All right, like that's all you're going to find in him. Yeah. It doesn't matter which way you cut him, he's going to bleed love and goodness and light and purity. Uh, so same yeah. for God, same for you. So there's that like, there's, what's the blueprint? What's the journey? Hey, the journey is sonship. The journey is transitioning from the orphan illusion into the bliss of sonship. That's the journey, right? Uh, yeah. It's the divine life. It's, it's stepping into the divine dance, participating equally, receiving an unbroken cycle of divine love, receiving divine love perfectly and giving perfect expression to divine love. It's walking in complete dominion over darkness. You will not walk, you know, you don't have a sinful nature. Separation doesn't exist in him. You live and move and have your being. You're as one as one can be, as in as in can be, as loved as love can be, as son as a son can be. You simply need to wake up to that present reality and agree with it with your whole heart and let him uh, de define you and surrender to that. So there's this dynamic of like the softness of our heart. There's the dynamic of actually understanding the journey, the blueprint. But here's another element that people often don't realize is so key to our spiritual journey in this trans transformation, this process is the spiritual environment that we live in. Because mm -hmm. we actually live in a culture and a spiritual environment. Listen, a, cult, a culture is the result of a sustained atmosphere, right? A culture is the result of a sustained atmosphere. And we live in an atmosphere and a culture that is overshadowed by a spirit of blindness. And if you look into moves of God, what you will find in moves of God is accelerated transformation because the spirit of darkness, uh, the spirit of blindness is rolled back and an open heaven is ushered in. And in the context of an open heaven, you can transform like that. You can go from deepest darkness, right? You can go from deepest darkness to pure light in no time. No time is required. Time is not a re requirement at all for going from the orphan illusion to the bliss of sonship. Time, there's no requirement of time. Hmm. What's required is... Uh, humility it's to agree with God how long will it take you to agree with God that's how long it takes to go into the bliss of sonship from the deepest darkness wow. and one of the biggest elements which we miss uh, misunderstand misread is that in an open heaven atmosphere just like that it can happen mm -hmm. just like that in that open heaven atmosphere that's sometimes why people have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus and walk away just like that that's why Marlene, she has an encounter with Jesus and coke addiction gone just like that. Why? Because it's in an open heaven atmosphere, in an encounter with him and that oneness with him, just yeah. like that. But when we start getting breakthroughs more and more into these regional open heavens, or you start running a 24-7 prayer and worship uh, space in your area, your locality, you create an open heaven or through spiritual disciplines in yourself you're actually creating an open heaven right here this is the most important place for an open heaven is right here right so that you can see truth you can come into agreement with it but if we can geographically roll back an open heaven you'll have what happened in the hebrides revival and the welsh revival where people are just yeah. walking down the street and all of a sudden they've given their whole life surrendered to jesus yes. right? no yeah. one said it then, on. nothing happened atmospheric shift so this is an yeah. element of intercession this is an element for us of you know, of, hey, we're going to, when we're going to aggressively start coming in after the captives and prisoners, we're going to actually be the ones that usher in an open heaven that brings, peels back the spirit of blindness. And so what's praying in the spirit going to do? It's going to help you create an open heaven in your life, around your life. You're actually going to create an open heaven when you're reading the word. You're going to create an open heaven when you're fasting. You're going to create an open heaven when you're loving extravagantly. You're going to create an open heaven when you're meditating on the world, word of God, which is going to fast track your transformation. That's what sacred rhythms are doing. It's helping you to create an open rhythm, or open, open heaven around your life. Yeah, that's so good. We've actually, at church, we have had people get healed just in worship. Oh, 100 percent and we're worshiping every nearly every night apart from saturday nights but but this is what we want to push in for is that 
that open heaven, that constant, and where people just walk in and they get healed. Yeah. It's just Priceless. beautiful. Well, Davina, uh, it is such an honor to have shared this journey with you. Um, last thing, very last thing, can you share with us a little bit about your dream? You've got a dream to bring people uh, out of darkness to rescue captives and prisoners. Just share with us a little bit about your dream as we uh, as we come to a close. Sure. Well, in oh, I joined the deliverance team in my church, but I'm keen to do some of this more like with people outside of our church online probably um, and raise up an army. That's what I'm really burning for, raising up an army to go into the dark places. And um, I've been on one mission trip into Kenya and we went into the darkest places. We went into the red light district and the ghetto and the prison and um, and preaching and drawing prostitutes out. So I would, I'd love to go and do that in different countries and see safe houses in all the different nations because you can't just pull them out and say, here, go and have a good life. You've got to um, now walk with them in this sonship journey and they need training and, you know, they need ways to make money, <laughs> you know, as well. So I'm, I'm really keen for that. And it's so exciting. We will look forward to being a part of that adventure together, sharing that adventure together. And uh, you've just started the 21 Day Hard Things Challenge as well, which is really exciting. I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing more and more good things happening for you. And I'm looking forward to uh, raising that army with you. Uh, you know, an yeah. army that will mm -hmm. silence the sounds of horror that rise before the throne. So thank yes. you so much. Do you want to pray for us and pray for yeah, sure. uh, anyone who, you know, who might be where you were or who is mm -hmm. really in that process of, you know, like, okay, I really need some breakthrough now. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, I, I want to thank you, Lord, that you are good. You are always good and everything that you do is good. And I thank you that this is a season now for... Um, acceleration in breaking people out of prisons and breaking them out of darkness. And I just want to declare if you are in that place, that there, there is hope for you. <laughs> no one is hopeless for the Lord. He is the God of miracles and he sees you. He, no one is actually forgotten or abandoned. The Lord sees every single one of you and he sees all of your tears he collects them in a bottle, it says, <laughs> and they are raised up before him. And so I thank you, Lord, that you see and you hear and you are um, on the verge of a big jail break. <laughs> so I thank you, Lord, that we, we um, I just pray that we open up our hearts to you, Lord. We open up our hearts to you and say, yes. So would you do this journey in us? Would we just say, yes. We don't want to strive to achieve something that's already ours. We are already loved. Inside, we're already perfect and whole. So I thank you for the outworking of that. And I thank you that um, no, no weapon formed against you will be able to stand. In Romans 8, it says, no. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or the past or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. What a delight and an honor to share this journey with you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and courageous. And I'm so excited for the journey to come, everyone. Bless you. And our next session with Professor Robin is coming up uh, for those who are live in 30 minutes. Uh, for those who are watching the replay, it's just the next one. So love you, fam. Love you, Davina. Thank what you. a beautiful journey. Bless you, Benji. Catch you soon. Bye. Yeah.